Tonight, an apology from the Prime Minister after Parliament honors a man with Nazi ties. The damage control for a diplomatic debacle. This was a mistake that has deeply embarrassed Parliament and Canada. The opposition says sorry isn't enough. He's got to take action. A monumental, unprecedented and global shame. Charges filed over an E. coli outbreak. We must take action to ensure that this never happens again. Identifying the source of the contamination that sickened hundreds of kids. We have a long-term road ahead of us. Plus a wave of smash and grab shoplifting. Free apples! Free apples! It is a very, very, very big problem. The growing problem on both sides of the border. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina. Good evening, everyone. The incident that triggered global condemnation also prompted an apology from the Prime Minister today on behalf of all parliamentarians. Five days after a man who fought for a Nazi unit was praised, applauded, and called a hero. All of us who were in this house on Friday regret deeply having stood and clapped even though we did so unaware of the context. It's a moment that unfolded during the Ukrainian president's first visit to Canada since the Russian invasion, and a moment Moscow's propaganda machine has now seized and is exploiting. CTV's Annie Bergeron Oliver starts us off. The Prime Minister faced the House for his first question period since Parliament gave a standing ovation to a 98-year-old man who fought for the Nazis. On behalf of all of us in this house, I would like to present unreserved apologies for what took place on Friday and to President Zelensky and the Ukrainian delegation for the position they were put in. But that apology isn't sufficient for the opposition, who question why a more thorough vet wasn't done on all guests invited to hear Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky's address. It is the duty of the Prime Minister to protect our diplomatic reputation. It was therefore his duty to ensure that his diplomatic intelligence and security forces ensure there was no one who could potentially present a danger. The Speaker of the House of Commons, Anthony Rhoda, has stepped down and said he regrets his decision to invite Yaroslav Hunka. The Prime Minister says nobody in his office was aware of that invitation. For all of us who were present to have unknowingly recognized this individual was a terrible mistake and a violation of the memory of those who suffered grievously at the hands of the Nazi regime. Apologies have been made at the ministerial level to the Ukrainian president and his delegation, but the government won't say whether Trudeau himself has made a call. As far as our relationship with Ukraine, I, I think probably and hopefully things will, will move in the right direction, although this, this will continue to be an embarrassment for Canada for some time. An embarrassment that is fueling Russia's powerful propaganda machine. Marcus Kolga tracks foreign disinformation and says this situation sadly fits Russia's narrative that the invasion was aimed at removing Nazis from within the Ukrainian government. The Russian government, Russian state media and Russian diplomats have gone into complete overdrive uh, exploiting this really terrible situation that emerged on Friday uh, to try and uh, embar further embarrass Canada uh, to divide us. Rhoda's resignation is effective tonight and though a number of MPs have already expressed their interest in replacing him, the secret ballot election Omar isn't scheduled until Tuesday. All right, Annie, thank you. A judge handed down a 12-year prison sentence to the young driver convicted in the hit-and-run death of a Calgary police officer on New Year's Eve in 2020. Sergeant Andrew Harnett died after being dragged 400 meters by an SUV into the path of an oncoming car. The driver was a minor at the time and charged with first-degree murder as a youth. Now 20 years old, a judge convicted him of manslaughter and ordered that he receive an adult sentence. Harnett was killed just six months before the birth of his first child. The shared kitchen at the center of an E. coli outbreak at 11 Alberta daycares that infected more than 350 people was charged today for operating without a proper license. And the province's chief medical officer also revealed the likely cause. Here is Bureau Chief Bill Fortier. 
meat loaf and vegan loaf from this catering company are now suspected as the sources of a massive E. coli outbreak at Calgary daycares. We're not surprised. Many parents, including Sarah McDonald, have believed the meat loaf was likely to blame since her four-year-old son became sick during the Labor Day long weekend. He's expected to make a full recovery physically. He's not coping well with the memories of the experience, so I think we have a a long-term road ahead of us in terms of healing. The food was delivered to 11 daycares. More than 350 people became sick, mostly kids. Most have now recovered, but four remain on dialysis with serious kidney complications. The good news is that the number of new infections has plateaued. The city of Calgary has now laid charges against fueling mines, alleging the company did not have the proper business license. Perhaps those violations would have been uh, found and corrected uh, had they uh, applied for a business license. The charges carry a maximum fine of $120,000. For some parents, that's just a start. What I'm really looking for is more changes in the legislation where we can catch these things sooner. And more legal trouble for the food provider. A second proposed class action lawsuit has been filed seeking $10 million in damages. The province is still investigating the outbreak and reassessing the rules for daycare kitchens. Today, naming former Calgary Police Chief Rick Hansen to lead the review panel. We know as a government that we must take action to ensure that this never happens again. There's no timeline for a final report from that review panel. In a statement today, Fueling Mind says it is working with Alberta health officials on the ongoing investigation. Omar. All right, Bill, thanks. Police are investigating a car explosion caused by a homemade bomb in the parking lot of a seniors complex in Barrie, Ontario. The neighborhood was shut down for hours with apartments and homes evacuated. The overnight blast startled people living in the area. Three o'clock in the morning, I woke up, it was a big bang. Like it, was, it wasn't a gunshot, it was more like a boom. Yeah, it's been a long night. I'm tired. I want to go home. <laughs> My girlfriend can't even leave for work. The kids can't even go to school. Police detonated a second bomb found near the exploded car. It remains unclear if this was a random or targeted attack. Canada's bid to be a key player in electric vehicle battery manufacturing is gaining traction as Ottawa looks to compete with the American clean tech industry and have a complete supply chain in place. Tonight, we are learning about the rural Quebec town that could drive that revolution. Here's Bureau Chief Genevieve Beauchemin on the transformation. Once the site of an explosives manufacturing plant, this land could soon be home to a key player in energy transition. But even before a formal announcement, a petition is circulating. Some living nearby worry about noise, odors, traffic. Now, the answer to what may come may be an hour and a half down a highway in Bécancourt. Excavators and cranes now run non-stop in the industrial park, creating a buzz in this corner of rural Quebec. <inaudible> Mayor Lucie Allard says it's one project after another here, since her town of 15,000, nestled between Quebec City and Montreal, found itself at the heart of a planned electrical vehicle battery revolution. <inaudible> Governments are pouring billions in taxpayer money into the industry, with GM and Ford among the big-name investors. We're at the dawn of historic growth with thousands of new jobs, says the mayor. It's brought excitement, but also challenges and concerns. Among them, some in town doubt the promised boon will come. Donald Olivier runs Bécancourt's industrial park, one of the biggest in Canada. It's near shipping lanes, railways and major highways. We have the lands, we have the infrastructure, so when they come here, they can start quite quickly. The park was built in the 1960s, designed to be a steel-making centre. But that mega-project and a series of others that followed never materialized. Olivier says the EV battery industry, though, is the right fit. That's in part because of Quebec's vast hydropower resources, produced by dams built decades ago in the north. When they come here, they have green energy. The work is already underway in the city, on these roads and on the plants. But the deadline is very tight. Most of these companies hope to be operational by 2026. The city is racing against the clock, planning neighborhoods, enlarging three schools, and providing a new ladder truck to the fire department. La population Bicancourt. Our hope is that our population will win, she says. That growth will bring great opportunities now that Bicancourt is on the map.
Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Bécancourt, Quebec. And a closely watched international climate change case got underway today as six young adults and children from Portugal took more than 30 European governments to court. They accuse them of not acting quickly enough to protect people and say it's a violation of their human rights. Today's case is about the young. It is about the price that they are paying for the failure of states to tackle the climate emergency. The plaintiffs are all between the ages of 11 and 24 and from regions hard hit by wildfires and heat waves. It's the largest such case to be heard by the European Court of Human Rights in France. A ruling isn't expected until next year. Chilling new details tonight on that catastrophic fire at a wedding reception in northern Iraq that killed more than 100 people and injured dozens more. And a warning, the images are disturbing. This video shows the bride and groom dancing when there are sparks from pyrotechnics machines. The ceiling panels in the hall catching fire. The newlyweds reportedly survived. Today, funerals were held for many of the victims in a Christian town near Mosul, once occupied by ISIS. Police arrested several people in connection with the fire, and the government declared three days of national mourning. After more than two months of captivity in North Korea, an American soldier is back in U.S. hands tonight. Travis King was detained after he suddenly bolted from South Korea into the North, a highly secretive nation with a brutal human rights record. CTV's Washington Bureau Chief Joy Malbin on the lingering questions. Travis King is finally on his way back home, said to be in good health and spirits. North Korea announced it expelled the 23-year-old soldier after he confessed that he illegally trespassed into the communist country, citing inhumane abuse and racial discrimination within the U.S. military. That's King last July. In trouble with the Army over assault charges, he joined a tour at the heavily guarded demilitarized zone and inexplicably bolted into North Korea. After intense negotiations, Pyongyang agreed to deport King, apparently receiving nothing in return. So I would not want to speculate on any motivations uh, on the North Korean side, and I don't know that I would, uh, would, would, uh, would take from this that it heralds some breakthrough in diplomatic relations. I think it's a, uh, a, a one-off uh, with them being willing to return this private. Officials praise Sweden acting for the U.S. and China for helping get King out, surprising some who expected his detention would drag on, using a U.S. soldier as a bargaining chip. He was a fairly low-ranking uh, uh, soldier. He wasn't an officer. He didn't really have access to any classified information. So there's not much he could have told them. It could have been much worse. Otto Warmbier, a student, was arrested and tortured in 2016 for taking a propaganda poster. He returned home in a vegetative state and later died. King's back. mother has asked for she privacy, saying home. she will be forever grateful to the United States Army and all its interagency partners for a job well done. I mean, she's overjoyed, relieved. Um, she's been on pins and needles these 71 days he's been gone. Why Private King willingly ran into North Korea in the first place is still a mystery, and he could still face disciplinary action. But first, he'll undergo health checks at a military hospital in San Antonio. Omar? All right, Joy, thanks. Police in Philadelphia arrested at least 50 people after a violent looting spree that lasted eight hours. Crowds of suspected thieves targeted stores and stole merchandise. And with the cost of living soaring, shoplifting is also increasing here. Here's CTV's Heather Butts. It's happening, it's happening, it's happening. Shocking video shows looters in Philadelphia storming into shops. The unruly crowd of about 100 people outnumbered responding police officers as they targeted several retailers. Liquor, electronics, clothing and sneaker shops ransacked. Police say they used a peaceful protest nearby as cover. What we had tonight was a bunch of criminal opportunists take advantage of a situation and make an attempt to destroy our city. 
As cases of retail crime escalate, businesses are being hit hard. In the U.S., the National Retail Federation says theft contributed to more than $112 billion in losses in 2022. It comes as Target announced it will close nine stores in four states, saying theft and organized retail crime are threatening the safety of our team and guests. Canada is also not immune. Some point to shoplifting driven by tougher economic times. With a lot of grocery stores using self-checkout, it's too easy now to steal. And I think some of these people are making uh, tough choices, um, you know, just to make ends meet, to live. Industry experts say they're most concerned about organized crime, theft in large amounts to be sold afterwards. There might be as much as 3% of the increase that we're seeing in prices right now uh, caused by, you know, just straight out theft. Tony Hunt is the loss prevention manager for London Drugs and says violent incidents are also up. You look at the millions and millions of dollars that retailers are spending on trying to protect our people and our businesses, and that needs to be built into prices as well. So it, it, can, it can have a really in, a significant impact on all of us. It costs us all. While financial losses are huge, retail crime has a significant impact on the health and safety of employees. Retailers want politicians and lawmakers to do more to help protect frontline workers. Omar. All right, Heather, thanks. Coming up, a new digital code for Canada. We need better protections in place. The rules of conduct for companies developing AI. Plus, getting on board at any age to break down barriers. Artificial intelligence is evolving faster than most of us can keep up, and that's prompted Ottawa to roll out a new voluntary code of conduct for Canadian companies meant to beef up protection and make the tech more trustworthy. But as CTV's Melanie Nagy reports, critics believe the code lacks teeth. This is going to be a landmark. Canada's industry minister was all smiles as he was joined by top tech companies in signing a new code of conduct. For the use of artificial intelligence, specifically generative AI, which is a technology capable of creating new content, including text, images and audio. A code of conduct that will demonstrate to Canadians that system that they're using are going to be safe. The voluntary code targets companies developing advanced generative systems, asking them to commit to six core principles including safety, accountability and transparency, such as clearly labeling any AI system that could be confused for human. Now there's at least a framework. Martin Kahn heads one of the companies that pledged today to uphold the code, which he says will help Canada explore AI's potential while mitigating possible risks. I do think Canada is being uh, or has a chance to be uh, on the vanguard of, of really thinking about how to uh, promote innovation, but in a very safe way. AI, such as the popular ChatGPT tool, has been widely criticized for creating copyright, equity and privacy problems. And some experts say a voluntary, non-legally binding code isn't enough to protect the public. It's uh, little more than window dressing as we move toward actually having legislation in place, which isn't here yet. Last year, the federal government introduced legislation aimed at regulating AI, but it has yet to be approved. We need better protections in place uh, and we need better frameworks to hold these companies accountable. As for the code of conduct, so far a dozen companies have signed on, including BlackBerry and TELUS. Melanie Nagy, CTV News, Vancouver. Another big name streaming service is set to nix password sharing. Starting November 1st, Disney Plus will change restrictions on account sharing outside the household and introduce a cheaper ad-supported tier. In February, Netflix announced a similar crackdown in Canada. Still ahead, the boss is taking a break. Bruce Springsteen postponing performances on doctor's orders. One of the biggest names in music is taking himself off the road. Bruce 
Bruce Springsteen is postponing his tour until 2024 on the advice of doctors. The boss turned 74 last week and is recovering from peptic ulcer disease. In a statement, he says, I'm on the mend and can't wait to see you all next year. The postponed shows include dates in seven Canadian cities. And one of Canada's long-running entertainment shows will come to an end after 18 seasons. Of course, entertainment is shutting down production of Entertainment Tonight Canada, blaming daily production costs in a challenging advertising environment. No word on how many jobs are being cut. The final show will air next Friday. The fascination with the Titanic remains strong even 111 years after it sank. A key from the doomed ship fetched $177,000 at an American auction. It belonged to Alfred Diebel, who was buried in Halifax. He was a first-class saloon steward entrusted with the key to the liquor cabinet. After the break, a 180 on skateboarding, rolling back the years in Montreal. Skateboarding has been around for decades, and while it's usually associated with young people, that's starting to change. More and more skaters who grew up gliding through the streets are refusing to bail on their favorite sport. Here's CTV's Vanessa Lee. Skaters are shredding big stereotypes on these ramps in Montreal. Constantinos Gray decided to get back on a board again after 42 years. What do you love about being on the board? Oh, it's just the uh, the kind of the kind of freedom. Kind of brings you back, hey? Being definitely, here? definitely, brings me back, back to my youth. <laughs> this is actually an old school board. It's uh, from the mid '80s. Gray started skateboarding when he was eight. For years, he remembers having his board with him wherever he went, and says young skaters often ask about those days. They want to know what did you guys just to do. Well, we used to climb into the swimming pools before the city of Montreal uh, in, the, in the spring, filled it up, cleaned it up. Since then, boarding has mostly moved from the streets to skate parks, with multiple generations trying tricks. <laughs> Marauder, he is amazing. And what I find fascinating is I meet other older folk like me that kind of either just started again or some of them, it's the exception, not the rule, some of them have never really stopped. Skateboarding became popular in the 1960s. And the love of the sport is still contagious. Guillaume Lécuyer is a pilot and decided to try it out during the pandemic at the age of 36 and is now hooked. The feeling of surfing, it's hard to describe, but uh, when you're uh, surfing, it's this feeling of being light and nothing else around you matters. No longer a hobby, just for the young. It might appear like a midlife crisis, but it is not. I'm just uh, reconnecting with some of my stuff that I used to do. So it's a continuation. Now that Gray has his balance back, he says he hopes to pick up more speed as he carves his comeback. Vanessa Lee, CTV News, Montreal. Well, it's great. It takes a lot of skill. And that's a snapshot of this Wednesday. Heather Butts is here tomorrow for all of us. At CTV National News, thank you for watching and good night.